All right, let's stand. This song is very apropos to our lives today. Again, with all the craziness that's going on in the world, we need the Lord, amen? amen. We need his guidance, his direction. We need all that he has to give us. That's right. Praise him. Give him a hand clap. Let him know that you are appreciative and thankful for all that he does for you. All right. Pastor Anthony, I know you're in here somewhere. All right. Let's ask the Lord to bless as we get into his word today. Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together, these doors being open your people being gathered, and I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, Lord, from anything that would hinder your spirit from filling me, and that you would fill me now, that uh, the words I speak are yours, that they would go forth, they would do what's necessary in the, the lives of your people, Lord. We ask your blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. 
There we go. Tuesday mornings, we do a Bible study here uh, for men and women at 10 a.m. Uh, and it, uh, again, it's not just here. It's on WebEx as well. Uh, and you could attend that way if you can't make it here. Uh, our recent study is going through the book of uh, Judges. Uh, and Judges comes right after the book of Joshua. Joshua, and they really kind of go, they really go together. Joshua is a book that details the conquest of the Israelites in the Promised Land. Uh, in it, we read of the great victories that the children of Israel were experiencing as God empowered them to defeat the enemies that were in the land that God had given them. Uh, we read about this, and we know that uh, as Christians, we're told in the New Testament that these Old Testament accounts, true as they are, are given to us as examples. So uh, we can learn from them. And in Joshua, we learn how to live a victorious, overcoming Christian life, a life that overcomes those things that wants to defeat us, the enemies that we face, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and to inherit all that God has given us. Uh, Joshua, the promised land, is not a picture of heaven. A lot of people think it's a picture of heaven, but it's not because in the conquest of the promised land where there's wars and battles and struggles taking place, where heaven is a place of rest. So um, a place where the wars of this life are over. So Joshua, to the Christian, is a book that teaches us how to have victory over these enemies that we face in life. And as Christians, we move from victory to victory. I know we feel like we're defeated all the time, but we are really moving from victory to victory as we are being conformed into the image of Christ. In the beginning of the book of Joshua, as he's about to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, he takes over from Moses. That's a big task in itself. But then God will give Joshua some great promises. So follow with me in your Bible in Joshua chapter 1. And uh, in verse 5, as he's taking on this position uh, of leading these people into the promised land, God tells him, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So God promises Joshua to be with him wherever he would go, that he would not fail him nor forsake him. Yes, there would be warfare. This wasn't going to be a walk in the park, so strength and courage were needed, because the next verse says, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give to them. Notice God looks at it as a done deal. He says that I'm, you're going to divide the land that, that I've given them. It's a done deal. But it would still require strength and courage on the part of Joshua and on the part of the Israelites as they go forth into the land. So we see there's human responsibility. God promises his presence and his power, but they were to still walk by faith in God's promises. They were still to trust in his power. And they would go forth and have victory. Note how Joshua was to go forth in verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success." The way Joshua was to attain this victory was to stick to the word of God. Don't turn from it, not to the right or to the left. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't listen to all the voices that are out there telling you there's a better way and a different way. He says, and if you do, you shall prosper and you shall have good success. The battle was real. The fight would be difficult, but the victory would be accomplished if he did it God's way. So God again says in verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You know, when you look about this, this, uh, you know, be strong and of good courage, it takes strength and courage to trust in the word of God because it goes so far different many times than the way we act and think. Uh, you know, the world is telling you all these different things. I was just reading a thing. Uh, somebody put an opinion on the Fox News website, uh, you know, about how his, hand, his uh, family handles the virus and they are praying. And of course, all the atheists jump on board in the comments and say, you know, well, how's that working for you and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, so it takes courage. It takes, uh, you know, strength to, I'm going to trust God's way and God's word uh, in it. 
and do it God's way. So Joshua stuck to the word and God gave him and the Israelites great victories. God had not failed them. He was faithful to his promise. And as if you turn to uh, chapter 23, as the book is coming to a close and Joshua's life is coming to an end, we get to read the final words of Joshua as he calls together all the leaders in Israel and all the people of Israel. And it says in verse 1 of Joshua 23, and it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest unto the Israel and all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel and their elders and their heads and their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. And you have seen all that the Lord God has done unto all these nations because of you, for the Lord your God is he that has fought for you. But I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes uh, from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. God would use Joshua to destroy all these strong enemies in the land. But there were still little tribes left that the, the actual uh, individual tribes would then be responsible to drive out of the land. Uh, so he says he was there, but there would be left some cleanup work. So Joshua instructs them now how they could have victory. Verse 5, and the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you. Isn't that something? Joshua knew, even though he was a, the great general, that his victories came because of God. And now he's instructing his people on the same thing. The Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess the land as the Lord your God has promised unto you. Be therefore very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turn, uh, that you turn not aside, therefore, to the right hand or to the left. The same instructions that God gave Joshua, Joshua is now passing down to the Israelites as he is passing on. Uh, stick to the word of God, and if you do, you will have great victory, and you'll possess all that God has for you. But he gives them a warning in verse 7. That you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man has been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God he it is that fights for you, as he has promised you. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will, not, will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your side, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. He tells them this. He, he says, listen, cleave to the Lord. Love the Lord. That means that be single-hearted to the Lord. If not, you're not going to see victory. And then he tells them in verse 14, and behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. Isn't that an awesome verse? Yeah. Not one thing failed, he says. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed thereof. Joshua is reaffirming to them that everything God promised happened just as God said. That the only thing that kept the Israelites from inheriting more land was they themselves. That they would settle for less. If you know the, the story that God promised them this vast land, the promised land was so much bigger than what they settled for. They got 10% of everything that God had promised them. And it wasn't that God's promises failed. His presence was there. His promises were there. His power was there. They chose not to walk in it. They chose not to trust God. God was ready God was available, but they settled for less. Folks, as you know, in this life, we are in a spiritual battle. As Christians, we're told that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, you know, the spiritual enemy that's out there. We are in a spiritual war, but many times, 
Even though the war is spiritual, it shows itself in the physical and in the emotional areas of our lives. Pastor Sam talked about this warfare last week and how we're to put on the whole armor of God. As we go into this battle, we put it on individually through prayer. Jesus promises to be with us, that he'll never leave us, that he'll never forsake us, that his power is available to us. But we have the responsibility to walk by faith and utilize his power in all these obstacles we face. And if we do it God's way, we will have victory. Following this book of Joshua, this book of great victory, we come to this book of Judges, which I said we're studying on Tuesday mornings. And so where Joshua is a book that we see the Israelites moving from victory to victory, the book of Judges is really a sad book because there's no longer these, this great, uh, great ascent upward. You don't see moving from victory to victory. Instead, you see the beginning of this roller coaster ride for the Israelites. Now we have to understand, they're in the promised land, but there's no longer victory. Judges teaches us as Christians what happens to individuals, what happens to nations that forget God. They no longer followed and trusted in God's way and it would lead to a breakdown in their society and it would lead to great sin. Follow me to Judges chapter 2 and we'll look at this. Verse 8 tells us Joshua had died being 110 years old. Verse 9 says where they buried him. And verse 10 says, and also all the generation that were gathered unto their fathers. All that generation. Joshua's generation. All those that lived through the conquest of the promised land. All those who saw the victories. All those who saw what God had done. Were now gone. And it says, and there arose in verse 10, another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the next verse tells a story. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. After Joshua and that generation that had saw all the miracles of God was gone. In just one generation, the next generation, we see that they would forsake the Lord and begin to follow pagan gods in the land. You see, man is created with the knowledge of, of God that we know and we're told in Scripture, eternity is in the heart of man. We know there's something beyond this. And if we're not worshiping the true and living God, then we'll worship someone or something else. Now in Judges, whether it was the parents or whether it was the priests who didn't do their part and maybe they failed to teach the word of God, maybe they failed to pass down a, a godly legacy, that's a possibility. But it could also have been possible that the next generation didn't listen. Maybe it was a combination of both. We don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but the fact is we know as, a, as Christian parents, you could teach the word to your kids, you could bring them to church, you could bring them to their groups, you could live the word of God before your kids, but ultimately your kids have to make a choice on whether they want to follow or not. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you give birth to saved kids. Everyone has to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. If you're here right now and you've, been, you've grown up in the church, I worry about the next generation, just like this in Joshua. Those that haven't seen it, say, I've seen it. I've seen what God did in this life. I've seen it. I've seen how he is faithful. How he could take a sinner and save his soul. I've seen it. Some of you kids who have been grown up in the church who... That's all you know, you don't understand, and you don't see it, so you think there's something better out in the world. A lot of Christian kids stray. Listen, our job is to build that foundation, and if they are to stray in the world, hopefully, you know, they'll come to the reality that to be with Jesus is far better. Sometimes kids stray. You could do all you want to do, but kids have to make that decision themselves. Everyone has to make that decision. 
to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, here's the deal. You are dead in trespasses and sin. You are, the wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. What we burn because of our sin is death and hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That Jesus paid our debt of sin at the cross. And if we place our faith in what he did alone, then we're forgiven of our sins and we're given this free gift of everlasting life. It's a choice that nobody can make for you. You're not born into it. You don't get it by going to church. You get to hear the message by going to church. But it's a decision you have to make. I'm going to, I'm going to place my faith in Jesus alone. Because I believe that he is the one that came to save us from our sins. And what he did on the cross was enough. See, in the case of judges, and the judges, the next generation, they chose to forsake the Lord. They chose not to follow his word. Instead, they were leaning on their own understanding. They chose by, to go by how they felt. The book of Judges shows what happens to a people who choose to go their own way. The book is really summarized in the last verse of the book. You don't have to turn there because I need you to stay where you are. But the last verse of the book says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what they felt was right. The Bible says there is a way unto death. Okay? There is a way unto death. There, many people think they're in the right way. But the fact is, they're on the wrong road. There's one truth, and that's God's truth, and it's found in his word. Do we know it? That's the key thing. And do we follow it? So Joshua tells them, you need to cleave to the Lord. You need to love the Lord. Don't have a divided heart. But the people would forsake the Lord. What was the result? Go down to verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, and the Lord, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. God gave them over to what they wanted. That's the key thing. They no longer wanted to acknowledge God. They no longer wanted to cleave to God. They didn't want to love God. They chose to live like the pagans around them, and God would give them over to it. Some commentators call it spiritual abandonment. Some call it the judicial judgment of God. We see the same thing in Romans chapter 1. Because they don't want to retain God in their hearts, God says, I will give you over to it. I'll give you over to what you want, you see. God gives people over. God gives nations over. God doesn't force himself on anyone. You want to kick God out, God says, I will leave, and you'll see what it looks like when there's not God in a nation or God in the lives of people. It's God's perfect just judgment. So to the Israelites, God gave them over to what they wanted. They wanted to be like pagans in the land instead of being different. He says, then, you know what, you're going to see what distress feels like. Let me tell you something about the world. Let me tell you some of you young people who want to go out into the world. You know, we got this mentality, either as Christians or even as kids growing up in the church, how far can I get to the line before it gets bad? You know, I always get that question when you're teaching the young singles. How many drinks can you have? And I keep saying, well, why do you got to keep going to the line? Why didn't you just run the other way? You know, why do we want to inch towards holiness instead of, you know, inch towards sin instead of running towards holiness? Uh, you know, but I guess that's human nature. You know, let me tell you something. If you want the world, if you want to experience, if you want to say, because I've heard this stuff, you know, well, you were out there, you're fine. Oh, yeah? There, take a trip with me someday. Right? Take a trip with me. You see, let me tell you something. The world, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The world is run by Satan. He's the prince and power of this world. The world is not ready to say, turn the other cheek. If it says turn the other cheek, it's because it wants to hit you on that side too. You know, it's not interested. The world is not interested in overcoming evil with good. It is truly survival of the fittest. And in this time in which we're living in with this global pandemic which is now about to start at six months on the earth, as people get squeezed, what's on the inside comes out. You know, the Bible talks about God hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
What that means doesn't mean Pharaoh didn't have a free will. It means that God put him in a position where he squeezed his heart and what was in Pharaoh's heart would come out. And you see the wickedness that came out of Pharaoh. I'm telling you, in this time, as this stretches on longer, it's going to get worse because what's inside people is going to come out. Just look at the news. People are getting crazier. This was said in the beginning. The cure is going to be worse than the disease because people are getting depressed. People are getting discouraged. People are, you know, getting whacked out. What's inside comes out. Well, we know if you're a Bible student, what's inside the heart of man, the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. That's the condition of natural man. Doesn't mean that they can't do good things sometimes, but when squeezed, guess what? It's going to always look out for number one. And the Israelites would suffer greatly at the hands of the Canaanites, who supposedly had become their friends. Just like the, you know, the, the, the prodigal son, that he went out into the world and he, everybody was his friend while he had money, but when he had nothing, it said nobody even gave him anything to eat. That's the world. You see, Canaanites supposedly were going to be their friends, but you know what happened? They began to plunder their crops and take their goods take their homes, you know, they would murder their husbands and wives and take their children. And they would, they would oppress the children of Israel and enslave them. Because of this sin, desiring to live like their worldly neighbors, Israel would reap what they've sown. God says, I'll give you over to that. If that's what you want, I'll take my hand of protection from you and you could have what you want. Let me tell you something. This is this spiritual roller coaster that we see in the book of Judges. You may say, why is he saying a roller coaster? Because you know what a roller coaster does. It goes up and down, up and down. And that's what you see in the life of the children of Israel in Judges, this roller coaster. Now, listen, I don't care. Roller coasters could be fun. I like a roller coaster every once in a while, right? It's exciting. It's exhilarating. You get to that top, all of a sudden, yow, right? But you don't want to live on a roller coaster. I looked, the Guinness Book of World Record for roller coaster rides. Richard Rodriguez of the USA rode the Pepsi Max Big One and Big Dipper roller coasters in Pleasure Beach, Blackpool, UK for 405 hours and 40 minutes. But even Richard Rodriguez got tired of the roller coaster finally and says, I got to get off. Okay, but this is what we see in this roller coaster ride of judges. We see this cycle of disobedience, God then bringing you know judgment to them, people crying out to God and repenting, and God raising up a judge, a civil leader who would deliver the people. The cycle lasted for 300 years, that's longer than we've been a country, a nation, and that would become the dominant mark of the Israelites. 300 years. Sadly, that's the dominant mark of Christians. They, you know, they, they live how they want to live, carnal lives. You know, God disciplines them because if you're a child of God, you're going to be disciplined. That's what he says. And we turn and finally say, oh, God, forgive me. And God restores us. And we just do it again. And you see this pattern continue on. Uh, I tell you, as dark a book as judges could be, it does offer hope. That God raises up people, flawed human beings, to help deliver his people. But why would the cycle continue? Why wouldn't people just say, i got to get out of this cycle? Well, I think there's a number of reasons that come to mind. One is the hard heartedness of man. Man is stubborn. Some lack spiritual discernment. Some, listen, as Christians, we're to be spiritually discerning people. We should know what's going on around us. We should be able to see that, you know what, this is not good. We should have some discernment. Some people are just going by how they feel and not by the word of God. We're seeing that even in the church today, folks. Just going by, let's go by feelings. Everything's feelings oriented and not the word of God. It's a dangerous place to be because we all feel different, don't we? And sometimes it's just because people are lukewarm. And they're feeling fine. It's lukewarm. I'm okay. Let me show you one of the instances of this cycle we find in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 3. In verse 1, 
It says, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Remember, the generation of Joshua died off. They were the ones who fought the wars. This new generation, they, they're soft. They know nothing about warfare. So God says, I'm going to leave. Joshua took out all the big tribes, all the big, hard tribes to beat. Joshua took them out. God left some small ones there to teach them how to have victory. And, and you know what? It was just this morning when I'm preaching outside, because it's one of those things that comes to my mind all the time, man, when I got saved, things fell off my life like I couldn't believe. It was like gone. Things were gone immediately. And now here, 30 some years later, there's still things that are there. And I'm saying, how can this be? Why didn't it all just go? And this morning, as I read this verse, it came to my mind, that's exactly why. God left the little things to teach me how to war spiritual warfare, how to have victory, how to know that, you know what, I need to depend on God. We sing the song, I need you, Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. But a lot of times, we're dependent on self. And God is teaching us how we could depend more and more on him. I just found that this morning. I said, oh, there it is. So he leaves these enemies in the land. Verse 3, he names the, those five lords of the Philistines, the Canaanites, Sandonis, the Hivites and, that dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount baal Harmon unto the entering of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Are they going to obey God? Are they going to do it God's way? Or not? It says, and the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And look at this. They took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Notice the progression here. God saw the evil they were committing. It says, first they forgot the Lord. What does it mean to forget the Lord? It doesn't mean, oh, God's not existing. It means that we're not mindful of him anymore. That he's not the first in our thoughts. You know, I like when people say to me, well, nobody's going to see it. God sees it. God sees it. The reason we don't do things is not, listen, that's religion. Nobody's going to see it. That's religion. Relationship is, guess what? God sees it. We got to understand these things. So they forget the Lord. You know, in the New Testament, it talks about neglecting so great a salvation. It's not that we don't know God's there. We just, really, we don't really take him into account. We get distracted. And this is the tragedy that came to the children of Israel. They became attracted to the prosperity and the lifestyle of the Canaanites. So they were seduced into their way of living. We've got to remember, sin is seducing. As I always say, if sin was a, a hot iron poker to the eyeball every time, we would probably not be seduced as much. Right? We would probably say, I don't think I'm going that way. So they're seduced into it. They buy into this lie that, you know what, God's way is, is holding me back and this way sets me free. And let me tell you something, when we buy into that lie, that God's way is grievous, burdensome, but you know what? The world's way is better. The world is just waiting to enslave us. Sin is waiting to enslave us. They would join up with these, Can these Canaanites. They would enter agreements and treaties with them. They would start to, you know, intermarry, as it says. Join in with them. And they became just like them. That leads to the second part, the second evil that they did. They worshipped other gods. They no longer worshipped the God who delivered them. They began to worship other gods. You know, God called Abraham and his descendants to be different, to be his holy people, to be set apart from the rest of the world. They were his witness to the world. That was their job. And listen, by the way, as Christians, we have been called in this dispensation known as the church age, we've been called to be different than the world around us. 
Bible tells us this in 1 Peter 2, 9. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Man, we're to be different than the world, not dirty like the world. Now, we all struggle with sin. There's always junk. I'm not saying we're to be sinless, but, man, we, our bent should be for the things of God, Amen. not for the things of the world. The Israelites forgot who they were. I'm going to tell you something. The minute you forget who you are, then you'll start taking on anything. We've got to remember, we are children of the king. If you're a Christian here, you're a child of God. You were pulled out of darkness. You were placed into the kingdom of God. And because they forgot who they were, and again, it was right after Joshua's death, the next generation, they lost their distinctiveness. Jesus says, when Christians act like the world, we lose our saltiness. They withdrew from the Lord. He, didn't become, he wasn't the thing that they were seeking after. You know, we're told in Scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That should be the first priority of our lives. Instead, they withdrew and they began to spend less and less time with the person, with the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. You spend less and less time with the Lord, the more you'll start thinking like the world. Just the way it is. Who you spend time with is who you're going to think like. I used to think about, I used to wonder, I'm saying, you know, as a pastor, how do people that have been married 30 years get divorced? How does that happen? They've been living with each other for 30 years until I started dealing with people. And you know what I saw? I saw people that, you know, they were living in the same house, but one was just, oh, just taking care of the kids. That's my job. Take, and their whole focus was on the kids. And the other one, the whole focus was on career. And 30 years go by and they're taking care of kids, taking care of kids, and this one's taking care of job, taking care of job. And guess what? Kids grow up and leave, job ends, you retire. 30 years go by, you're not doing life together. 30 years changes people. Are you different today than you were 30 years ago? I would hope so. You wake up one day and all of a sudden you're living in the same house with this person that you haven't spent time with for 30 years. You look at them and you say, who are you? And I don't even like you. That's what happens. Listen, we are called into a relationship with the Lord. And if we don't develop and dwell in that relationship and do our own thing, We'll draw away from God. The natural inclination of natural man is to draw away from God. That's the way it is. That's what we see with the children of Israel. So we've got to ask ourselves, how much time are we spending with the Lord? Last time, two weeks ago when I preached, I said, are we giving God, just give that 10 minutes in the morning, are we giving him first? Are we getting in his word just to talk with him first? The Israelites had forgotten the Lord. Now they're in, they're in false worship. The words of Van Halen, they're running with the devil. So to get their minds right, God would discipline them by allowing them to become enslaved to the world that they wanted. And the world wouldn't be kind to them. In verse 8, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the king, that king right there, of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served him eight years. That name is, I'll mess up that name so bad because there's about... 30 letters into that. That's the King Alphabet. Remember, that was, a, that was a serial at one time. King Alphabet. All right? Finally, war would break out, and God would allow this king to conquer Israel. But we've got to understand how this plays out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He's the king of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is north of Israel. Okay? So he has to come down into Israel and start defeating the country. Now you're saying, well, what's the geography lesson for? The geography lesson's key to this whole thing, okay? Because the southern tribe, southernmost tribe in Israel is who? Judah, okay? That was the one furthest away from Mesopotamia. So what's the big deal about the geography lesson? It means this enemy's moving from north to south through the land, kind of like a wave, a progression that's pushing its way southward. In other words, it didn't happen all at once, all of Israel most likely began to see this oppression start to come in, start to feel that they were in bondage. They were, you know, suffering poverty and hunger because kings would take away the people's food and allow them to hunger. They would take their possessions and their crops and their children. 
They would have their properties either destroyed or they would be overtaxed so they would be choked out. And they'd be in bondage. No freedom to travel. Unable to develop themselves and to express and anything else. Locked in their homes. This is what was happening. Evil was destroying them. The evil that they themselves had committed began to enslave them. And sin and rebellion has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Think it's good, but then it enslaves us. They'd sown the ways of the world, and now they're reaping what they did. So what did they do in verse 9? And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. There's this roller coaster. They sinned. God disciplined them. They cry for help. The Lord raises up a deliverer. Notice, though, God didn't move until the people sought after him. But that's the way it goes through Scripture. Listen, in salvation, it's God seeking after us. He draws us to himself. If you're not saved here today, guess what? God's drawing you. You heard the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He paid for your sins. He rose again. Place your faith in him. Faith alone in Christ alone that saves. But living the Christian life, that, that is our responsibility to walk by faith. You know what we want to do? We want to see God show us the whole plan first. And then we decide if we want to walk in it, right? God, show me the whole plan. Then I'll decide if I want to go. And God says, that doesn't work that way. You take a step of faith and I'll reveal a little bit to you each time. We don't like that, do we? I think one of the biggest problems with this whole pandemics kind of thing is we don't know how it's going to play out, right? How's this going to play out? God, if you just show me how it plays out, I'm calm. I'll just, you know, I'll just stay home. I'm good. I'll put my mask on. I'll just stay home. But we don't know how it's going to play out. That's a little frustrating, isn't it? But we're to walk by faith. We're to walk by faith. You know, uh, you know God opens the Red Sea, picture of salvation. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But how did the Jordan open when they start this walk of faith into the promised land? When the priest puts his foot into the, into the Jordan, that's flooding over, by the way, then I'll open the waters. And that's what God does for us. He says, I want you to take that step first. You take that step, and then I will move. So they finally take the step here. And they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord raises up a deliverer. What I find amazing here, aside from that king's name... What I find amazing here is how it all played out. Think about this. I find it amazing that they saw this takeover coming and did nothing about it. Then it took eight years, eight years of oppression before the Israelites finally cried out to the Lord. Again, how can that be? Because it took them that long to finally humble themselves. But why didn't they run to the Lord earlier? I mean, if it was that simple, cry out to the Lord, the Lord raises up and delivers. Why didn't they, why didn't they do it earlier? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. In my mind, I'm sure there's many more, but one, I think they didn't want to stop what they were doing. They liked their sin too much, and the oppression wasn't too bad. Maybe they were trusting in their own power. Maybe they thought, you know what, this will soon pass, so we'll be okay. Maybe. They thought they were God's chosen people, so nothing would ever happen to them like that. But the Bible says that God would allow it, because God disciplines his own. God disciplines his own. You know, when I think about this, when we were doing this study and I started to think about it, one, it was amazing to me that they would wait eight years before they finally would seek the Lord. But then the thing that really kind of got to me was in 1 Peter chapter 4, when it talks, Peter's talking about suffering. One of the reasons that God allows suffering is to purify his church. So could it be that what's going on in our time is done so God purifies his church? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Because it says this in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin first at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? God says he's going to start his judgment in his house. So if this is truly the last of the last days, can this be 
God beginning his judgment in his house? That's a question we'd have to ask ourselves. You know, it's kind of, that's the verse that stirs in my mind. When I look at the book of Judges, I, I see these parallels to America. We live in a nation that has forgotten God. God has been kicked out of all areas of society. And because his word has been cast aside, we see everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. Right? Isn't that the saying? That's my truth? Let me tell you something. When I hear that, that's about, that's about gets me like this. I get like a bullfrog. My neck gets about this big. I want to say, in a good Christian way, I want to start headbutting people. I really do. It's like, oh, are you kidding me? It's your truth. There's one truth, and it's God's truth. And it's found in his word. So the results of what we're seeing being played out in our cities and in the lives of people in this country is because God has been kicked out. You may say, ah, oh, that's too simple. No, that's the answer. Now, we as the church, we could say, well, that's them. It isn't us. It doesn't affect me. Listen, let's not play the fool. God never wants his kids to be stupid. Did you know that? What's being played out in our nation will soon be at the doorstep of the church. Just as Judah in the south saw it coming and did nothing about it, the same thing is happening in the church. We see it coming and we're doing nothing about it. And I got to ask why? Well, most Christians don't care. It's not happening to me. It's in those big cities. It's out west. It's, it's somebody else. Most Christians don't care. Or... Most Christians are waiting for the government to do something about it. You know, think about it. We're waiting for the government to do something about it. And we're not utilizing the greatest power on earth. The power of Jesus Christ, who sits over all. We're not doing it. Listen to this in Matthew 16. After Peter confesses, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. He's not building the church on Peter, but on Peter's confession that Jesus is Lord. He says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what the world is trying to do? The world is trying to close in the church. Uh, listen, you can believe what you want. Again, I believe the virus is true. We've seen enough of it. But I believe that there are those that are using it to close down the church. To exercise authority over the church. You could disagree with what you want. Keep your head in the sand. I don't care. Just the way it is. I believe so. And I believe that here's the good news. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So when Satan sets up a gate, guess what? We got the key to unlock it because Jesus gave the church authority. But we're not walking in authority. That's the problem. We are not walking in authority. He says, I will give thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Keys are a picture of authority. And then we read, listen, Matthew 18, 18. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall set loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth by touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This whole talk of binding and loosing, we, we don't have full understanding, but it's definitely apparent authority that the church is given. And it says, I like how it says, when two are gathered together, he's in the midst. You know, I read earlier, Joshua said, one shall chase a thousand. Well, in Deuteronomy 32.30, it says, one shall chase a thousand and two shall chase 10,000. Now that's an interesting thing. Now I'm not good at word problems, all right? I'm not good. Then when they start putting, you know, how many eggs and how many ducks and how many this and how many that, I'm, I'm kind of bad. I remember in fifth grade, it happened all the way back in fifth grade because I, I was never good in word problems. And my brother helped me one day with my homework. So I get, I get to school that day with the answers finally to word problems. And I was pumped up. And you know how kids are when they're pumped up when they know the answer. I'm doing this the whole class. Ooh, uh, uh. <laughs> Sister Lucy didn't call on me once. Broke my heart. I, I never did math again. I was done, Sister Lucy. 
It's the truth. And I don't, so I don't know math that well, but one will chase a thousand. In my mind, two shall chase 2,000. God's got a different way of math. Two shall chase 10,000. We see this, this effect. It says when two or three are gathered together, he's in the midst. You know what the church isn't doing in all this thing? We ain't praying. We may be praying individually. We're not praying as a church. We're not praying as churches. Who are we kidding? Who are we kidding? You know, in Acts chapter 4, the early church, when they were persecuted by the Sanhedrin, you know what they did? They called a prayer meeting, and the church got together and prayed. You know, when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12, you know what they did? They called a prayer meeting, and the church got together and prayed, and God did some amazing things. God shook the place. You know, as I read the scripture, it tells me God changes not. I believe God is still able to shake the place. It's not God who's not ready. It's not God who's not available. It's not God who's not willing. We are not doing it. It falls on the church. Judgment starts in the house of God. What are we doing? What are we doing? That's, that's the question I guess I ask. We have to ask ourselves, as the church, are we truly trusting in this power? As we have access to the throne of grace, are we crying out to God? Again, as a whole, I believe the church isn't doing it. This church, I'll speak for Victory Bible Church, a microcosm of the church in America. Are we praying or are we looking for a man or for a woman that's going to stand up, you know, some political figure? Maybe we're waiting for November election, that's it. We're waiting for a November election and if the right person gets in, then everything's going to be well. Are we praying? Oh no, we know what we're doing, we're waiting for a vaccine. And in, its time, and in this time, you know what we're doing? We're cowering in fear as we choose whom we will serve. You know, in the beginning of this pandemic, we were told two weeks to flatten the curve. Now we're coming into 20 weeks, six months later, and we sit here physically distanced, wearing masks, watching a computer screen to a virus that survives 99% of the people. You may not agree with those numbers, Check them out yourself. We're cowering in fear to a virus that is real, that we know people have died, that people have got it, but 99% of the people recover. 99 point something something. Again, you may not like to hear that, but that's, let's talk numbers. And that's if even the numbers we're given are true. Think about this. I believe that there, there are powers out there that want to divide the church in a time when we need to be united. You heard me talk about it this week. If you get the emails I sent or something like that, listen, we're going to allow a mask to divide us? Wear a mask, man. What's the difference? Wear a mask. As I said, we're not asking anybody to die for anybody. We're just asking to wear a mask so that people could get together. If that's what's required, wear a mask, then wear a mask. <laughs> So that we could get together because I'm going to tell you something. In these times that we're in, the church needs to be together. Amen. And we need to be united as one. Because it says if we gather together and agree on one thing, God will move. Let me tell you something. It is time for the church to seek the Lord. It is well past time to cry out to him. For this nation, as we see it slowly eroding from our sight, we need to pray. And not just talk about praying. I'm going to challenge everyone. Listen, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we meet. And if you can't make it here, guess what? We meet on WebEx. Do you understand what this is saying to the church as God purges his church and purifies his church? It's saying to the church, wait a minute. I could sit home and still come to prayer meeting? And I'm not doing it? Shame on us. Shame on us. The greatest power that we could have in this world, throne of grace, to stop the onslaught of what's going on. I'm not coming to prayer meeting, even though all I got to do is sit here in my home and can a computer. It should be a shame for us. We've got women who meet on a Thursday night. You can meet through WebEx. We've got men who meet 6.30 on a Friday morning. You can meet through WebEx. What's our excuse? Got something to do? 
How's that going to look next year when who knows what's going to happen? It's time for the church to get serious. Jesus says that you say unto this mountain, move, and it'll be removed and cast into the sea. There's great power in prayer, not because of us, but because of who we're praying to. What are we doing? What are we doing? Now, let me tell you something for you young people out there who think, you know what, that's for those old people. Guess what? You're the next generation. We'll be out of here soon. You're inheriting this. What are you doing? Why aren't you praying? Seriously, you're inheriting this. Why wouldn't you be seeking the Lord? I would hope that as Victory Bible Church, for all you people out there listening, why don't we commit to crying out to the Lord in this time? You could do it from your own home. You give me your email address, I will invite you. You could join us right from your own house. There's no excuse. I would hope that you would consider that. I want to tell you something. Our God is a God of hope. And there's nothing too hard for him. You could look at this thing and get discouraged and say, oh, this is never going to end. Oh, look at the Marxists are taking over. Oh, look at all this stuff going on. Our God is a God of hope. But we've got to seek him to see him move. I speak to our conviction. I pray that you would consider it this Wednesday night. And I always say this with a little asterisk. I understand your work. I understand you got vacation. Nobody's putting anybody under bondage. But are we crying out to God in this time? If you haven't done it before, oh, I don't know what's involved with prayer meeting. It's easy. We do a little lesson, a little devotion. We take prayer requests and we pray. Oh, I don't like to pray in public. You don't have to say a word. You could just amen. You could just amen. Children of Israel waited till it was too late. Let not that be said of us who have access to the throne of grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that we would each learn a lesson from this and the importance of seeking you corporate prayer, no matter the age, but that we, we, we would seek your face, Lord. And that you'd bring healing to the land, you'd bring healing to your church. Father, we just lift this up to you. And I pray for each of us that we would prioritize you and your way. That we would walk in it, not turn to the left or to the right. And in doing so, we would have good success. We thank you that you are the God of all hope, that we could cast all of our cares upon you, that you care for us. And we do lift up this nation as we see it just eroding, we pray that you would intervene, that there would be a true Holy Spirit revival in this land. I pray for the church, Lord, that the church would seek your face, that we would cry out to you, humble ourselves and cry out to you, for we are sinners, Lord, forgive us. And I pray, Father, that you would bring revival to your church in this time. Father, lastly, I lift up anybody here who's never come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Maybe there's some young people in this room today that have grown up in the church but never bowed a knee to Jesus. They know the, they know the Bible. They know, this, they know all the accounts. They know the gospel. But they've never truly submitted their hearts to Christ. I pray for those today that are in the hearing of my voice. That if that's you and the Lord is calling you, then answer that call right now in the quietness of your heart. Just say, God, forgive me for my sins. I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. I believe he rose again. I believe that he is the only way to be forgiven and to go to heaven. So I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking Jesus Christ to come into my life, to be my savior, to be my Lord, to save my soul. Listen, 
As I always say, if you prayed that prayer, something like it, God hears the heart. And he has done just that. Now grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's stand as we close out our service. We're going to sing.